Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Global initiative to document Islamic vision and visionaries, values and movements in the 21st century. Future Focus. Presented by International Institute of Islamic Thought, Triple IT, USA. Institute of Objective Studies, IOS, and Manzoor Academic and Research Consultants, Mark New Delhi, India. Future Focus. Documenting the life, thought, and works of Dr. Abdul Hamid Abu Suleiman, Rector of the International Islamic University, Malaysia. Founder member of International Institute of Islamic Thought, its chairman, trustee and former president. Born in 1936 in the holy city of Makkah, Abdul Hamid Abu Suleiman studied and grew up in a home with traditional values and an emphasis on thinking, reading and learning. He travelled to Egypt to study in the University of Cairo, completing his graduation in commerce and post-graduation in political science. He obtained a doctoral degree in international relations from the University of Pennsylvania, USA. A dedicated academician, his doctorate on Towards an Islamic Theory of International Relations set him on a lifelong journey into understanding Islamic thought and imbibing values enshrined in the Holy Quran. Through his work in Saudi Arabia in the State Planning Committee and as Chairman, Department of Political Science at King Saud University, Dr. Abu Suleiman refined his own thought and set a process of redefining and reconstructing Islamic thought. As Founder and Secretary General of the World Assembly of Muslim Youth, from 1973 to 1979, Dr. Abu Suleiman initiated various programs for the development of the Muslim Ummah. His travels across the world in quest for peace and justice testify to his commitment for all mankind till date. As founder and the first president of International Institute of Islamic Thought, Virginia, USA, Dr. Abu Suleiman displayed his leadership and academic brilliance in the field of Islamic thought. His seminal works on the Islamization of knowledge are pioneering a movement for the reconstruction of Islamic thought in the 21st century. Reforming contemporary knowledge and revitalizing higher education are landmarks in contemporary Islamic literature Towards an Islamic theory of economics, crisis in the Muslim mind, followed by crisis in the Muslim psyche and will, demonstrated his insight and brilliance, besides underscoring his commitment to the reform of the Muslim Ummah. As founder member of the Association of Muslim Social Scientists, he ensured the Journal of Islamic Social Sciences became a force in academic circles. In marital discord, Dr. Abu Suleiman's emphasis was on recapturing the full Islamic spirit of human dignity. Warm and compassionate, a man who believes in upholding traditional family values, Dr. Abu Suleiman is an erudite and eloquent academician whose activism has defined his pioneering spirit. Dr. Abu Suleiman's life, works and thoughts are being presented in future focus with a view to providing a road map for generations to come. Dr. Abu Suleiman delves deep into his research on Islamic traditions and shares his learnings with us. When I was in the International Islamic University, the rector of the university, when I went there, it was a small university, 
with about 1,000 students in two faculties, law and uh, economic. Now, and also, you know, uh, preparatory years uh, before they go into the college, the faculties. But they are put into big rooms with many beds together. I never spent this kind of residence during my life. But I found it very difficult. These young people will be there for many years. It will bring social conflict. Somebody would like to sleep, somebody would like to put the light on, somebody would like to hear the radio. All this will get them in trouble with one, somebody would like to study. So, but you can do nothing about it because this is a state university and this cost. But then when the decision come to build the new campus, part of this new campus going to be 15,000 student residents. So I said to myself, I'm going to sit and make sure that the student will get the best possible benefits within the area located per, per students. So I said to myself, let me analyze what is the best and what is the second best. I said, is it the best really to have one student per room? I said, no. Simply because these young people come, come and mother used to take care of them, cook and wash and do this and that. And, you know, he comes here, he has to take care of himself to cook and wash and do all these little things. And he will be going into a new kind of education, different approach. So I consider him like the family of a deceased. Don't leave him alone to cry for himself. Better keep him, you know, in the crowd. So one is not a good idea. Okay, I said to myself, Two. I said, no, again, it's not a good idea. Because the two, surely something will happen between them to, you know, of conflict. Who's going to bow first? Who's going to accept, to admit? Who's going to allow? That will create a problem. I said, okay, three together. It's still not a good idea. Usually two will go more closer and the third will be out in the in the open. Four, I found all kind of conflicts resolution will be in this four. That is the minimum of what I call society. Now at that point it came to my mind a problem in Sharia could not be explained. Nobody ever said why in adult in approve in proving adultery you need four witnesses? Why not two? Enough to execute in case of somebody kill somebody, two enough to kill or to execute. Why not three? Why not five? Nobody explain why four. Yes, the group, yes. But what is the point behind four? Immediately I realize, when I read the verse in the Quran, the punishment is not for the action. The punishment because you are hurting others by acting in society of this bad behavior. To hurt others who are not party to your problem. If you do that, then you are punished. For isha'atul fahisha, to make the bad behavior common. That is not allowed, not acceptable. And that is why, also, if the witnesses are less than four, three, in one case, where the three see exactly what happened, and the fourth give what you call, say, you know, an evidence, although, you know, it couldn't be anything else in what he said. They are to be punished, because they are less than four to see exact, and they are the one who made this problem open. That is why they are to be. Now, then what is the... If that means it's okay to commit adultery? No. There you have two things. One is upbringing and education. That the real 
way to deal with problems of the human nature. Because in human nature, we can never say we are saved never to commit a mistake. That's impossible. That is why if you're going to spy on people and to follow on their weaknesses, you make them you know, feel unsafe. That is not allowed. And that is why the Prophet Sallallahu when he got the young man asking him for to, to allow him for adultery, he didn't threaten him. He made self, self control. People who behave improper or open their homes for this kind of practices, there is a different approach for this, what they call al mufsidun fil the people who, who spread corruption and not you cannot accuse them of adultery, but you can accuse them of spreading the you know the corruption in the world. That's a different story. So what I here I discovered two things from I was working on nothing to do with Sharia or with the penal code or anything. I was discussing or thinking of social and and psychological problem. I realize why it is for and what is the meaning of the punishment. Not only that, that also led me to that is crimes and mistakes of two kind. The human nature and the the rights of others like money or blood or you know this kind of crime. Now in crimes belong to human nature, I find I cannot be, I cannot say I never commit a mistake. So I don't want you to fall behind me and to look behind me. You make me unsafe. And that is why when the, uh, Sayyidina Amr, the second Khalif, hid a noise in one house. So he went over the wall and looked and found them drinking. He brought them. They said, yes, we drank, but we didn't go outside. We didn't disturb anybody. He could not punish them. Because this is belong to human nature and this privacy. It is not your right to go into the privacy. You work in, on education and upbringing in advice, but you don't threaten uh, security of human being in his own self. But when it comes to money or blood or this kind of crime, the punishment is for the action itself. Because I want, I may not never think to kill anybody or to steal from anybody, but surely I will fear that somebody may kill me or may still uh, take my uh, property. That is where you want to stop that. And that's why you accept two and even less than two other evidences to prove because you are for the action. That's great. Second thing, because that, you know, it led me to really to think about the human nature. In some countries, when they want people to fear Islam, they raise the issue of penal code. It looks very severe. If you kill, you will be beheaded. If you steal, your hand will be cut. If you make a facade, you will be uh, crucified or killed or cut your hand, you know, one hand and one leg. That looks very severe. And, you know, societies. So people will say, okay, with Islam, it's great, but we cannot take that. I found there's, there's great misunderstanding about this, this issue. Look, for example, if somebody kills somebody, yes. You could, the family could demand the execution of the person. But if you read the next ayah, you find, ask you to forgive, not really to go for revenge. But, of course, on the other hand, if the family are not accepting to, you know, to, uh, to help, it's better for revenge because that will kill much more people than that. So, execution is the ceiling, but you are required to go down even to let go. That means any punishment less than the ceiling, it's acceptable, as long as it prevents crime. And this is what you find in, uh, in even modern uh, societies. You find for some time they apply execution for certain crimes. In certain times, 
they just uh, stop that. So it depends on what to stop the crime, it's not a revenge. Now we go for stealing. If we read the ayah, it says, whoever commit theft, cut the hand. Now, that means, السارق والسارقة فاختوا أيديهما جزاء ما كسب نكالا من الله. A male or a female person who steal has the hand will be cut. Now, that means anything anybody do which could be described as uh, stealing, the hand should be cut. Even scholars realize that is not possible. So they looked at how it has been practiced and to find limitation to limit this kind of uh, punishment. So they came up to say it has to be a certain amount to make it possible to the hand to be cut and has to be in a safe place where you know really it shows the intention to do and so on. Many of these. Now they did not realize that they are saying the Quran expression was loose and they are you know trying to make it complete. This is not true. Because if they just read the next ayah it says if the person repent Allah will accept. That means then cutting the hand is the ceiling. And it goes all the way to accept repent and. And that means if the person made a mistake is if the lower punishment really make people not to go for this kind of crime. That's acceptable. It is the ceiling where really this kind of criminal could make, you know, great impact on society. And sometimes even that uh, stealing goes with other crimes. So if we look at it at the ceiling and the society and the sure of the society can choose any other kind of punishments which is enough to you know to protect society is acceptable but you don't, you cannot go beyond the ceiling in all case okay let's go to the third one people who made crimes which really disturb societies and spread corruption and problems it says in uh, in alladhina yuharibuna allaha wa rasulahu wa yas'awna fil ardi fasadan an yuqattalu أو يصلبوا أو تقطع أيديهم وأرجلهم من خلاف أو ينفوا من الأرض. People who fight against Allah سبحانه وتعالى and His Messenger. That means about against the proper, you know, thing in society. And spread corruption. To be killed or crucified or hand and leg to be cut or to be expelled out of the uh, society. So you can see the killing is the ceiling. And it reached down to just make the society safe by sending him out, put him in jail. And especially nowadays, you know, crimes committed by addicts. It is really hideous and it's really terrible. So these people to be put into prison and you don't allow them to go out until they are safe to the society. So you have the ceiling and you have the bottom. And if it's up to society and to people to select and decide in which way to punish, I don't think that make anybody fearful. As a matter of fact, in stealing, Sayyid Namar who knows there is a kind of uh, shortage of food and uh, because of rain, uh, he did not, he stopped punishing anybody for stealing. Once also a young man who seems to, to make a mistake committed the, uh, you know, a, a crime of stealing. So he told him, did you steal? Say no. He said no, and let him go. So here, if we looked at hudud as the ceiling, you cannot go beyond and up to you to decide which can protect the, your society, I think that is very acceptable. It's not a problem at all. Thank you.
Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Global initiative to document Islamic vision and visionaries, values and movements in the 21st century. Future Focus. Presented by International Institute of Islamic Thought, Triple IT, USA. Institute of Objective Studies, IOS, and Manzoor Academic and Research Consultants, Mark New Delhi, India. Future Focus Documenting the life, thought, and works of Dr. Abdul Hamid Abu Suleiman, Rector of the International Islamic University, Malaysia, Founder Member of International Institute of Islamic Thought, its Chairman, trustee and former president born in 1936 in the holy city of Mecca, abdul hamid abu suleiman studied and grew up in a home with traditional values and an emphasis on thinking reading and learning he traveled to egypt to study in the university of cairo completing his graduation in commerce and post-graduation in political science. He obtained a doctoral degree in international relations from the University of Pennsylvania, USA. A dedicated academician, his doctorate on towards an Islamic theory of international relations set him on a lifelong journey into understanding Islamic thought and imbibing values enshrined in the Holy Quran. Through his work in Saudi Arabia in the State Planning Committee and as Chairman, Department of Political Science at King Saud University, Dr. Abu Suleiman refined his own thought and set a process of redefining and reconstructing Islamic thought. As Founder and Secretary General of the World Assembly of Muslim Youth, from 1973 to 1979, Dr. Abu Suleiman initiated various programs for the development of the Muslim Ummah. His travels across the world in quest for peace and justice testify to his commitment for all mankind till date. As founder and the first president of International Institute of Islamic Thought, Virginia, USA, Dr. Abu Suleiman displayed his leadership and academic brilliance in the field of Islamic thought. His seminal works on the Islamization of knowledge are pioneering a movement for the reconstruction of Islamic thought in the 21st century. Reforming contemporary knowledge and revitalizing higher education are landmarks in contemporary Islamic literature Towards an Islamic theory of economics, crisis in the Muslim mind, followed by crisis in the Muslim psyche and will, demonstrated his insight and brilliance, besides underscoring his commitment to the reform of the Muslim Ummah. As founder member of the Association of Muslim Social Scientists, he ensured the Journal of Islamic Social Sciences became a force in academic circles. In marital discord, Dr. Abu Suleiman's emphasis was on recapturing the full Islamic spirit of human dignity. Warm and compassionate, a man who believes in upholding traditional family values, Dr. Abu Suleiman is an erudite and eloquent academician whose activism has defined his pioneering spirit. Dr. Abu Suleiman's life, works and thoughts are being presented in future focus with a view to providing a roadmap for generations to come. Dr. Abu Suleiman shares the foundations of his faith and the methodology of research and questioning that he has developed based on Islamic principles. When I was in secondary school and I was reading a lot about 
all different religions and cultures and history, uh, philosophy. So I ask myself a basic question which explains why later I have interest in Islamic and social sciences and why I have the patience to follow and to keep you know, steady and not to change mind. Now when I was at that age, I asked myself, is it I'm Muslim because I am born in Mecca and everybody is a Muslim? Or is it because really something true I have to commit myself? Then this is the way I thought about it at that age, and which influence my, my way of dealing with these uh, issues. I said to myself, the universe is very complicated. It is beyond my comprehension. And this is not my business. I am here, going to live my life, and go. But if somebody came to me and said, I have a message for you from beyond, that's a very serious matter. I cannot ignore. I have to look at it and make sure, is it really a message for me or not? Then I put three standard to see if it fits or not. The first thing I said to myself, if he bring me a message, it should be authentic. Exactly the same said by the beyond. Immediately all old religions are out because they were their religions, they were their prophets, they were uh, wise people. But nobody of this old religion can say exactly if any specific saying really said by them or not. It, you know, through history things confused. Okay, but I find that the Quran, it was the only book which is authentic. As a matter of fact, it is really a miracle to be authentic through all these ages. Because the system was created for him, it can never be, you know, really explained how it happened. For example, it was written the first day it was revealed, piece by piece. But that's not enough. You, when you see the uh, professional readers of Quran, they relate in a chain to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by hearing, not by reading. Third, Muslims has to, to read portion of this book five times a day. And they read it for knowledge and for worship. So if you change one letter, the whole world will shout at you. I, I can watch TV and I can see pictures. I cannot trust that they are real, because I know that could they play with it. They can select, they can put it differently. So it is authentic. But the second thing is, I said to myself, it has to be good. And whoever people read Quran, they know it's a good message. And there is a verse in the Quran. Even at that age, I consider it the heart. Anything told for me, which go opposite to this verse, I won't take it. And I have to go myself and find for myself. And this says, إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يأذكم لعلكم تذكرون. Allah require or order justice and perfection and good deed and giving to the people around you and forbid فحشاء things which is not good taste or acceptable or munkar things reject by uh, human nature and oppression so this I consider you know the heart anything goes against it I won't take so it is a good it's a good message but who said that it is coming from beyond why they say this man wrote it and want to make it looks better or more uh, obliging by saying it's from God I cannot go to God and ask him, did you really give it to him or not? So I said to myself, I have to look at him. Either he obliged me to believe that he's a messenger, not an author. 
or not. I looked, I know, I know the history of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You know, he was born already. His father died. His mother died while he was six years old, and that's very important stage for the psychology of the child. After that, he was raised in uh, by his grandfather and then by his uh, uncle. He was in a very simple uh, environment, no schools, no philosophy, no education, no writing, nothing. He never assumes any responsibility as leader in his community. He was a child, youth, a man, got married, got children, reached 40 years old. He was not known for any ambitions. It's impossible to keep secret ambitions through all this process as a human. I know that. So at that point, what do you find? He called on his tribe and say, O oh, Quraysh, if I tell you an army coming behind these hills, would you believe me? They said, yes. We never experienced uh, any lies from you. He said, I am a messenger of God. Now, to have that ambition, after all these years, not to show, at the time, if even if you have ambitions, you start de deserting them. That is not normal. That is something very special. Now, again, let us look at this man. Now, we know in our world, humanly, you go to primary school, to secondary school, to university, and then you specialize, you got your PhD. You may be good in, say, politics or in uh, military or in business, in one or two fields. But to have a man without any base, without any education, with, in a very simple uh, environment, without any experience, and suddenly, he is the best in military, in politics, in philosophy, in leadership. That is, although each one of them could happen to humans, but to have them in this manner is not human. It could not be. Not only that, but young people who were around him, of his age and his own home, who proved themselves later as great leadership, like Omar, like Abu Bakr, like Ali, like Uthman, like many others. These people suffer with him for 13 years without any hope, with all difficulties, and not to disbelieve him. I think, I thought to myself, I'll be crazy if I doubt he is a messenger, and not a man who is telling lies or, you know, acting in his own. That is why this is was important simply because made me to look at the quran at the sharia as a true authentic message so whenever i people arise some question about the meaning or the appropriation of certain thing or the other i don't go doubt because if you doubt you cannot have the resilience really to study and to be uh, to have the patience to find out. It is like if you are suppose you are going from here to south, Mumbai. If you are sure that Mumbai is south, regardless how long it takes, you will continue until you reach Mumbai. But if you don't know Mumbai south or east or west, you will go a bit through that direction. You change, you go to a different direction and you can never reach any of So that gave me the resilience and the patience, really, whenever there is arise a question, I sit and I look at it patiently until I find the truth. Now, there was two methodologies I used always to be aware of them. First, I don't go, I don't go discussing any issue if I don't have the background of it. Second, I don't take one quotation or one part without putting it in the big picture so you know, you really know what it means. Because 
if I tell you, is one million dollars a lot of money or small amount of money? If you tell me it is a, a big amount of money, I tell you you are wrong. If you say it's a small amount of money, I tell you still you are wrong. Because if a one million dollar is a monthly salary, yeah, it's big. But if I tell you the budget of India or of any state is one million dollar, I say this is nonsense. <laughs> so it is not one million, but it is for what? That is very important in the way of thinking. And that is why you find there's many problems I faced. And while I was studying, especially for my PhD or, you know, afterwards, and I looked at the issue and I analyzed and I reached different conclusions, simply because I am sure that it's going to be good, so I don't hesitate to spend the time and to have the patience. On the other hand, also I use the right methodology. Otherwise, then you can make nonsense without knowing what you are doing. Dr. Abu Suleiman takes a journey back to his childhood, what he learned and the values he imbibed that have shaped his personality and his research over the years. Uh, let's go back to childhood because still there's many lessons we can, young people can learn from what, uh, how it happened. Uh, there were three things in my childhood of very importance, how to help the child to grow in a good way. One of these was dedication of mother. Second, good library. And third, kind of training of thinking, uh, being analytical and uh, know how to debate. Now, for the dedication of mother, you know, in Mecca, especially at our time, as, at, at my childhood time, it's easy for people to use unpleasant words exchange this kind of words and you know for myself going to school in the morning in the afternoon helping father in his carpenter shop so always you are hearing these words and seeing how people you know talk to each other and my friends who are not uh, Mekians they say it is very difficult for us to believe that you are a Meccan simply because we never hear you utter one dairy word. The reason, at home, we never hear one dairy word. And my mother, I used to know, she never protested against father, against anything, or comment, or even demand things. Whatever he brings, she accepts. But only in one case, when we get together at dinner time, and that's the only time almost we, we get together, males and females and all family. And father, by mistake, utter one word which is not that unpleasant, but still improper. She would say, no, Abu Muhammad. That's the only time we hear her to protest. I remember one time, I came home and I made a quarrel with one of my sisters. And I said, you know, in Arabic it doesn't sound like what it sounds in English. Uh, son of a bitch. Not son of a bitch, but uh, son of a, of a dog. And that is what it means in Arabic. Dog looked up and down, but in English it has different uh, connotation. So it is really not that dairy. It happened that mother was standing. She didn't talk to me, she didn't insult me, she didn't get angry with me. The only thing, it looks, until now I remember how it looked, as if some disaster happened, just looking at me. I never forgot that. I never even said that word, kind of word. I remember one of my daughters, she's uh, over 30, 
got her education in Saudi Arabia and in uh, Egypt, in the United States and in Malaysia. She roomed the whole world. She got a master. She's working. And one day she came to me. She said, Father, if there is insulting words more than donkey, I said, why? She said, I hear things which I never thought could be said. I looked at her and I looked at 30 years old, booming the whole world, and she doesn't know these kind of things. Simply because she never heard at home. That, that was the real, the real reason. I, you know, my father used to smoke kabli bubbly and mother used to smoke cigarettes. I never thought ever to touch these things. Now, how that could happen? If my father sat just, you know, smoking hubbly bubbly and saying nothing, I would imitate him. And especially, you know, how it looks, look at ladies, alhamdulillah, how they are doing it. I don't know about uh, India, but I know about Arabia. It really looks ugly. Now, how that could happen? He didn't sit there silent. He was always complaining, seeking the help of God to stop it, showing it is a weakness. And one time I was cleaning it for him. He said, do you see this black material? Same will be in my, in my uh, lung. So I'm not a crazy. He's complaining. He look at his weakness. It's, it's bad. Why should I do it? So whoever the smoke around me, I want. I remember mother once, my younger uh, brother, he was very little, very small. And she was smoking and he came to pick up the cigarette. And one of my sister was close by, she took it from his hand and, you know, shouted at him. She said, no, leave him alone, leave him alone. She sat him next to her and prepared another one new cigarette and lighted it and gave it to him. Of course, as a child, he was looking for sweet. When he, uh, you know, put it in his mouth, he didn't find that. He threw it away and forgot it. So, and another example, that's how you teach with example and with patience and understanding. When that younger brother was, you know, in the street in front of our house, something happened, uh, fall from some people, which is they uh, use it to uh, cook uh, the uh, beans. So he was happy to find it and to carry it and bring it home. So I was there and I saw mother. She took the little boy in her hand with whatever in his ha hand, happy that he brought it from outside this way and brought him next to the window and make it throw away again. So he understand he would never bring things from outside. So that was the home, the quiet, the uh, peaceful, and the one who is watching on the children, correcting without, you know, fighting. And there also the library, where I was reading the Islamic, the Western, the uh, contemporary, the old, all kind of materials. I was uh, reading it. That was a source of, of knowledge and keeping a child, you know, uh, learning in his own and you will be surprised that uh, in family library children can read much higher than what you think they can and they will understand and that is why you know when I was uh, secretary general of uh, World Assembly of Muslim Youth I suggest to someone uh, and gave him a plan to develop what I call Muslim family library because I, I saw many, many homes, there's nothing called library at home. And for these parents who are not, you know, educationist, wouldn't know what to select for their family. So we developed a book, selecting different kind of books in different subjects for different uh, mem family members, parents, uh, children, youth, uh, and so on. So to help these people to be able to build their own library uh, without uh, fear. The third thing, you know, my father, he was a very quiet man. I never heard him or my mother 
ever talking about people or criticizing or mentioning anything. That is why you find me, I cannot talk about people. I cannot talk about things. If you sit with me, we have to talk about ideas. It doesn't come to my mind at all to speak in this, uh, in this uh, aspect. Now, one of his friends, as a matter of fact, the closest one to him, was close to him for one reason. When he sit, never talk about people or others. And father like that. Now, but this man has, he was, has certain quality. Whoever come and say something, he will argue the opposite. And at that time it was maybe 40, 1945. I remember one of the, you know, because at that time I would be about eight years old. So someone will come and say, Churchill is a good man. He will argue, no, Churchill is not a good man. Hitler is a good man. After that, somebody else come and say, Hitler is a, a good man. He said, no, Churchill is a good man. And the child is listening you know, to the argument, how the same person changed the argument and make a point. That was also a, a mental exercise, which was, was very good. And that is why in the International Islamic University, I, was, I took a great care of student affairs. And I made debate as the culture for the whole university. Because when you debate, first you have to know. Second, you have to be able to understand the other party, point of strength and weaknesses, and how to bring it out, and how to be convincing. Now, not only that, but also getting different young people from different countries in that university. When I left, it was 96 nationalities. Now they say it's over 100. That kind of interaction create really good awareness in, in, in that sense. And also different, uh, all kind of programs open to them. That is where, you know, I learned that because if you give this kind of activities and environment to young people in education, you get different quality than if you just concentrate on class and just uh, memorizing uh, materials. This is, you know, the kind of environment we have to create for, uh, for our uh, children. Now, the other thing which is important about childhood, also, you know, when you really uh, ingrain the quality in the child, regardless if you are there or not, they will behave. I remember when I left uh, Mecca, uh, and Mecca, when I was young in Mecca, I never left Mecca except to Jeddah and Taif. It's two small cities nearby. And then went to Cairo. Cairo is a big metropolitan. There, no restrictions, no father, no mother. I'm free on my own. I was 18 years old. And I remember, you know, I knew some of the, uh, my fellow Egyptians and uh, some also from Saudi Arabia. And we decide to go to the uh, to one of these uh, casinos not casino for playing uh, no casino means where to drink tea and coffee or, you know on the nile so when i went there i, I sat uh, they brought uh, one big uh, you know with the ice and uh, one bottle in inside then i could guess what it is i never you know drink in my life but I guess what it is, I'm reading and I understand. I said, what is this? They said, we would like to drink. I said, okay, you can drink. I don't drink, I'll go. They said, why you don't drink? I said, look here, I'm going to ask you one question. When you answer me, you would understand why I don't drink. I said, is it possible if I drink, I do something. If I'm not drinking, I won't do it. They said, it's possible. I said, I'm not crazy to do such a thing. They said, just try. I said, no, I'm not going to try. They said, why? I said, if I try, it is either one of two. Either I like it, I don't like it. If I don't like it, I don't miss such an experience. If I like it, I would live all my life sorry that I don't drink, forget it. And I just left. So that is how home, how quality, how peace uh, is important in raising the child. Dr. Abu Suleiman's pioneering thoughts are rooted in Islamic traditions. 
he presents his views with conviction and candor. I looked at the Quran as concepts and concepts apply to different times and places in different way to achieve the same result to achieve the, the uh, meaning of that concept you cannot apply it in every situation in the same manner it, and that is where we benefit from the actions of the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the way he applied the, con the concepts of the Quran to the real life in his time and place now another problem I was reading in the Quran of course you will find the concrete things in the Quran belong to two things wherever there is a relationship which is not changeable and especially about family because the psychology of man doesn't change really and the family relationship as a husband wife and uh, uh, father and son it is it is not changing so there you have specific instructions about these relationships but whenever it is no developing changing it gives you the concept for example i all the muslim scholars know the word shura consultation that the ummah run its affairs through consultation now they know that consultation from time to another from situation to another is different and the quran just only mentioned the concept he did not go into details uh, so this is the nature of concept so i was reading an ayah that allah saying it should be there an ummah who call for goodness and defy the wrongdoings and the uh, you know things which nature does not accept what struck me here the word ummah because ummah means group or institution so I said to myself where is this institution in the Muslim history what was its job what has what it has done where is it we why we are missing it I start from that point as a political scientist I realized that there is a problem and this is the key to understand how to resolve this problem now and I wrote a paper the the title is Ishkaliya that is the problem of oppression and corruption in the history and the Muslim thought why is the problem because we know beyond doubt according to Quran the relationships the running of the, uh, the Umam affairs it goes only through Shura and it is emphasize justice and no corruption but we know since the Umayyad almost the Muslim history of government is oppression and corruption so how this happened why it happened now this could not happen if the Muslim thought and not Islam if the Muslim thought would not allow it so I thought let me see in which way really this happened and how what is the, the trick which allowed this matter to happen if we remember that Christianity has been harmed greatly when the, the religious or people control the politics of their people what happened in Islam it is the opposite when the politicians or the political uh, institution control the religious now we know that the people the Muslims should decide the, the policies they decide their interest decide what they should know what they should do and they are the guardian over the government especially the executive if it happened the opposite that the executive now are the guardian on the ummah they will work for their own interest to control the politics and the wealth of the nation and that what happened and uh, that when political uh, institution control the religious people it turned most just to justify 
the misbehave and the corruption of the executive and the people around them. The solution is how to reverse, how to bring the Ummah, and that is I found we have to do two things. First, religious education should be independent, so they can give the values to the Ummah, and through the Ummah they will tell the executive what to do for the interest of the Ummah. Also, the executive are not the state, usually in the Muslim literature, they say when you try to not allow the, uh, the executive or the political institution to speak in the name of the holy, they would say you are separating politics from religion. This is not true. They don't understand what the, main, the meaning of state. The state, it is the land, the people, and the regime. The executive only one part of the regime. And if you stop the regime to speak in the name of the Holy, because once you speak in the name of the Holy, you are always right. There is not going to be uh, exchanging hands, there is not going to be uh, plurality at all. They are always right, and right for their own interest in that sense. So, but if you teach the people, if the people are aware of their values, aware of their uh, interest, they will guide the government to do the right thing. Because any political program, it is not a matter of halal or haram, right or wrong, uh, in the real sense. Because within the right thing or allowed things, there is many point of view. Which point of view is going to prevail? That has nothing to do with the idea of being allowed or not allowed. So there the other factors comes. Is it better to go for agriculture or for industry, to go uh, in relationship with A or B? There is different interest in that and the people have to, uh, to decide. And the government has to excuse, execute. If they did not do it right, they dismiss them and bring others. They are the guardian. And they will take care of their interest beside also their values. Uh, as a matter of fact, if we look at the world today and look at the different regimes or systems or ideologies, we find some against religion and against the spiritual values like Marxism and other ideologies or systems in like the Western Europe, they, the religion itself made themselves irrelevant. They are most, you know, just kind of ceremonies. There is other states where they sideline the religion and values. And they just use it in time of burials and in time of uh, celebrations. And there is another one which use and abuse religion for the interest of the, the political elite. Now, what is needed to resolve, to bring this religious values of justice, peace. In this manner, we have to rethink and go deep to understand the different relationships, the different roles, and no place to talk about separation of religion and state in the case you make the Ummah are the one to guide and to be guardian over the government to do the right job. Once the government or the executives or the colleagues around them are the guardians, they will do it for their own interest and they will be corrupt, no doubt about that. And the Quran made it clear, الَّذِينَ طَغَوْ فِي الْبِلَادِ فَأَكْثَرُوا فِيهَا الْفَسَادِ فَصَبَّ عَلَيْهِمْ رَبُّكَ صَوْتَ عَذَابِ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ لَبِ الْمِرْصَادِ الَّذِينَ طَغَوْ فِي الْبِلَادِ The people who now tyrant, they also it will make facade, that is corruption. But Allah will punish them. He is watching, that means any nation which allow oppression and corruption, they will be punished, uh, that they will be deteriorated and they will be abused and they will be in bad shape. And this is what happened to the Muslim Ummah. Then we have to recapture, to make sure that the Muslims are the people who are good. They are not the bad ones. You don't threaten them. You teach them. 
you allow them to take you know things in their hand to seek justice to seek peace to to seek development and to watch for the executive to do the right job and whoever do it somebody else do it and that is in the West they call it democracy but in Islam they seek justice they seek peace it is not power politics it is not nationalism and it is not racism that is very important we have really to look at the Quran as concepts to understand what it means in which way we apply to time and place uh, scholars should should be aware of time and space how to understand the true meaning of traditions Dr. Abu Suleiman takes us through several examples and his own works I wrote a book uh, called The Theory of Islamic Economics Philosophy and Contemporary Means in that work I took all the traditions and verses of the Quran related to economics and I tried to see if there is an understanding which fit all this without applying three methods used by the uh, old ulama. These three, some of this tradition has been dismissed as abrogated. When I looked at it as a student of economics, I found they did not understand these traditions and they did not understand in which way is related. The second one was making tricks so it would to avoid some traditions. The third way was just to ignore. You don't say it is not true but you don't understand, you ignore. The example of the first one that the Prophet always in Medina in the Muslim society prohibit renting land on basis of sharing the crops and he called it riba that is not allowed but we find the Prophet ﷺ made sharing crop with the Jewish people in Khaybar that is outside Medina another place not far too far away but and they said this is the last thing the Prophet has done so that means whatever before it doesn't apply this is not true because the first traditions apply to the internal economy the uh, Khaybar uh, application was in ex international or external economy and they have two different aspects in internal economy we find that the state may give the land free may give even subsidy minimize taxes because whatever you do it will reflect on others it create jobs it may create uh, strategic industry that's totally different but if you give your land or your money to another society far away from you and you get nothing for your resources that is not fair the first thing is to you they use the uh, the land in this case and get their share from the crop either high or low so no injustice to be done to the people using the land so uh, they are not abrogating each other they are totally different the example of the trick that the Prophet ﷺ once was passing and so one of his companions called Rafi ibn Khudayj cultivating a piece of land he said whose land and whose work he said it is my work and the seeds and the land belong to somebody he said take your you know the worth of your work and seeds and give back the land you committed riba that is an acceptable kind of deal we find then how they deal with this they don't understand what is the idea behind this so what they have done some of these ulama they said if the work and seeds from one side and the land from another that is riba because that is how the tradition said now if the la if the work from one side and the land and the seeds from the other is okay now 
without to express whether important the cease to be here or there to change the rule. That is a kind of trick. And the third case, it is the tradition of Osama ibn Zayd, who said riba is only in getting more for time, not for work, not for anything else. The ulama did not understand that, and they kept what we call riba, riba al-nawa, that is, that you always get, you know, we have riba al-nasiya and the other riba, which were, you are not allowed to exchange the basics of that time, like grain, like dates, and except for equal amounts. Now, to get equal amounts for these basics, this is not possible, because it happens only in two, in two cases. One, when it is, you, are, you are exchanging the same quality, and there's no point in that exchange. Or it happens by chance that one for one it's acceptable. They did not understood what the Prophet was trying to do. The Prophet ﷺ came to a society where primitive, no state, no money, and it, it used partial deals as basic. And partial deals cannot allow economy to grow. You have to have money. You have to so you will be able to expand. And he tried to do that. By putting these ba six basics equal to equal make it um, almost impossible. And that you see another tradition we explain to you. This unique and marvelous policy. They told him that your governor or your uh, officer in, in Khaybar takes one measure of certain date for two measures of a different kind. He said, does he do that? They said, yes. He said, call him for me. The man came, he asked him, do you take one for two? He said, yes, because they won't sell one for one. It is two different kind. He didn't tell him really it's wrong. But he made the point. He said, sell this one for money and buy with the money the other one. So that was really. So Rebel Fadl should be no more riba. And that is where they did not realize this and they ignored the tradition of Osama ibn Zayd. Anyway, this experience, as a matter of fact also, you can see you know, the policy of the Prophet ﷺ, which shows how it is worthless if you understand the circumstances and not try to apply it again, <laughs> same again for the indifferent situation. In that simple society, limited society and you want now to use money you need to bring money which are acceptable to people that is gold and silver at the time now how he will get this money for these people there are two ways either you make minerals and mines and bring gold or you can make surplus in your trade and get gold and silver for that. Now, that was both impossible at the circumstances of Medina. So what he did? Simple order that gold is not to be exchanged except for the equal amount of gold. Same thing with, with silver. That immediately make it money. Because you cannot do anything with it and get any money out of that. That immediately make it money. So. He provided the, uh, the money in a very simple manner at that time. One tradition shows the difference between commerce and monetary policy here. Muawiyah, the uh, companion who uh, came to Islam in the last year, and he is a merchant from Quraysh. He was appointed governor of Damascus, and there was Abu Darda, an older Sahaba. He was there, so Muawiyah sold a piece of ornament with more than its weight. As a merchant, of course, it worth more. So Abu Darda told him, gold is for equal for equal. He said, but it is an ornament. 
He said, I tell you that the Prophet Sallallahu said that, and you say this is my opinion, I won't stay with you in one place. And went back to Medina and told the Khalifa Umar what happened. Umar radiallahu anh wrote to Muawiyah, gold is equal for equal. That, that is how we can understand these policies. Nowadays, when gold is no more money, what to do with gold if you don't use it for other purposes? It will be a mistake to stick to the same until in different circumstances. Anyway, this experience made me very much aware of time and space and how to look into the traditions. Dr. Abu Suleiman is concerned about the future and the future of the family. The nature of parenting is foremost in his concerns. The way I analyze things, the way I can see in the uh, Sharia, in the light of the new circumstances, time and space and new challenges, the way to analyze, it has some value for the young pe people. Not only by telling them, but also by showing them in which way this has been achieved, and also this life experience, in which way handled the circumstances which many young people seems maybe not aware of or failing really to pass. I am being married now for almost 50 years. Now, to carry the marriage life in a, a good way for this long, I think our young people need this experience because the rate of uh, divorce, the uh, problem of the young, uh, because of they are really imitating foreign cultures which doesn't fit this kind of hope of solidarity and keeping the morals, one of the reasons. So to tell about this experience, it will be very useful, inshallah. Because this issue, family and women, the morality of family was what carried the Muslim world through the hectic history and if we can if we lose this family morals and support it will be disastrous the family in the West has been disintegrated and it's in great trouble and it's a big mistake to try to, try to imitate at the same time living the old and historical experience in this time and in this changing time and new circumstances, it will be a mistake. We have to fall back on the fundamentals in the goals and try to achieve it in the space-time of this time. That is how we have to approach our heritage, our religion, our morals, one thing also, you know, the, our education, although it's good in one aspect, but it, was, it failed us in another aspect, which still we are failing our young people in that sense. We used to learn only words, to sit on a chair in front of uh, the wall and to memorize and to repeat. No involvement in laboratories, in experiences, in building, in doing, in creating, in waiting, nothing of that. So the world for us, it was only rhetorics and words. And it's still that way. And that's why we are failing really to have industrious young people, to really develop industries, to create and to be creative. Unless we change this pattern, life is not words and it's not rhetoric. It is action, it is experience. And here we have to study, understand the, mess, the psychology of slave and how to re-educate parents, how to raise their children, how to create a free person, how to give the room to the child so the child can think, can criticize, can be honest, can uh, be creative because if the environment around the child, all authoritative 
and he has just to follow and to accept he will, ne will, he will never be able to be creative, to take initiative and to be courageous and if we looked at the how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dealt with children we can learn a lot of, of ideas for example when he was talking to a child that is Ibn Abbas he emphasized two major points which we are losing in the way we raise our children the first one to bring love and mutual support between the child and God not fear and unhappiness the second is to teach the child courage self-trust self-trust and to express himself and his opinion and to stand for what he believes regardless what others say and what he, he we told Ibn Abbas oh boy Ya Ghulam remember God God will remember you please him he will please you so do the right thing when you are on ease he will come to your uh, rescue and help when you are in difficult times so it is love and support not fear the second don't worry if the whole world want to do something for you Allah would not allow it won't happen don't think that they can give you something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not allow they can do this thing he is not teaching the young, the young uh, boy but he is giving him the self-trust and the courage when he talked to an adult he didn't talk to his heart he talked to his reason when he say make tawakkul depend on God so he said do I uh, leave my camel and make and depend on God he said no tie the camel and depend on God after that so that is the difference between addressing a child and addressing a young boy also when a young a boy uh, came to property and didn't know what to do with himself he went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and told him allow me to commit adultery now the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not tell him no if you go to hellfire I'll be going to punish you no he didn't threaten him he gave him self control education terbia what he told him do you accept this to your mother he said no to your sister he said no to your auntie he said no then he told him all women either mother or sister or an auntie that means if you if you do it you are allowing it to happen to your family and that was self-control now when he was praying as an imam in the mosque his, his nephew Hussein came to the mosque and went over his back when he was in sujood to play he made the sujood long after the prayer finished the people behind asked him and why it was long was there a revelation or something he said no my child rode on my back and I hated to haste him now what that means we people who don't understand child psychology would say he loves his child of course he loves his child it's, uh, or children especially if the child is the, do the son of his daughter he wasn't saying that because that means um, you know taking my time to play with my child and allowing uh, you are back I don't care about you no he was not saying that he was telling them this child didn't understand prayer didn't understand uh, sujood didn't understand being imam or leader of the prayer he saw his grandfather down he went over his back to play if he immediately put him down he will only feel rejected but when allow him to play a little bit and then put him down he was taking care of this child how to deal with this child once he was giving a you know a ceremony or a speech to his people and the little girl the daughter of his daughter came to the mosque and of course she will see the people listening uh, quiet and uh, her grandfather standing and talking even adult will be taken by this kind of uh, situation he will, came down from the Robert and took the child over his hand, uh, arm and continue his speech when he used to walk he was the prophet he was the head of the state and he was the 
commander of the home, uh, armed forces, as they say these days. When he sees children, he makes salam to them. He talks to them. Take his time with them. Now, that is how he was a father and the grandfather never beat a child in his life. He doesn't need to do that. One of the problems, you know, we are facing commonly, most of, of the people in the third world and many of our countries will lie easily. We see the politician lying to us. We don't care. We know that they are lying. We don't protest that. Now, would our religion allow us to make lies? Of course not. The Prophet ﷺ made it clear. A Muslim should not lie three times. Now, how this happened? Is it because we think that lying is right? No. We know it's wrong. We wish we don't make lies. But we don't study human nature. We don't understand how to deal with this. How we, get, we fall into such a problem. I show you how. You are speaking in the West. They don't like lying. What happened to Clinton? Because he, he lied. Not on state business, but on personal matter. But they don't accept that from him. And now we see the trouble with the administration because again of, of, of lying. Uh, with Nixon before it because he was li he lied. Now, the question is how this happened. In the West, you know, speaking, they read a lot about education. And when the child made a mistake, the father or the parents will discuss the matter with the child. The child understand where he made mistake. He will try to please his parents, of course, as a child. And if they have to punish him, they make it, you know, not severe. The child can't take it. So he has the courage to tell the truth if he made a mistake. Now, what we do? because of our ignorance and not taking care of educating parents how to deal with the child, to understand the psychology of the child. Now, when he make a mistake, usually we say we'll give him a beat so he will never repeat it again. Okay? The child don't understand. The child is angry, refusing. He will do it again, but he will lie about it. To as a mechanism to protect himself from this abuse. And with the repetition of this kind of behavior, we find the person develop this kind of mechanism. Whenever he's in trouble or whenever he's embarrassed, he will lie. And we know that, we accept it. So if we are to undo this kind of big mistake, we, know we should know how to bring a child, how to take care of Parenting. Dr. Abu Suleiman's work on marital discord is path-breaking. His insights into the subject and his words of caution are noteworthy. I don't look at any issue unless I know the nature of the issue. At the same time, I try to put it in the big picture. I don't take it pieces. So, I said, you know, I know the ayah, which says, when there is, you know, dispute and uh, lack of harmony between husband and wife, Quran asks that the husband should advise. If the wife did not respond, then he show his unhappiness by not anymore staying with her in the bed, and then says the simple direct word is "adribuhuna." beat them. Now, this, this I know in Arabic language, it widely words used for indirect meaning, not direct meaning. So I said, let me first, you know, look into the basics of Islam, how it works with this proposition of, of beating. I said to myself, would Islam agree or approve that a, an adult beat another adult to force him or her to something they don't want to do? 
The answer is clear for me. No, it won't. I know Quran made it clear that the relationship between husband and wife, it is love and compassion. Is this any sort of love and compassion? Of course not. Also, the relationship uh, is beating. A way to resolve dispute. Of course not. Now, you can force somebody to do something they don't like. In one case, when they have no choice. But in Islam, you know, a wife has the same right like man. She can seek divorce. And uh, if she doesn't want to stay in, in, in the marriage, she has the right to leave. The only condition here that they don't allow that this to be a mean of getting some benefits, uh, material benefits, because that could threaten the, the family, either from the wife or her family. The man, when he, when he divorces, he loses, because he loses the dowry, he, uh, the expense uh, and maintenance are for some time, and then to remarry, so he already getting punished. But if the wife can take the dowry, and whatever she got, and run away, uh, without giving any reason, that's her right to ask to, to leave there. So you don't encourage this by allowing her to gain from this uh, action. Anyway, so the wife can also leave the marriage. You cannot force her to stay. Then beating is not going to work. So, uh, so I realized there is a problem. So the first thing I did, I looked at the word daraba, beat. How it is being used in Quran. It used in many, many places. In all of them, never means beating, except in three places. Uh, one of them, for example, when uh, Allah asked Moses, Moses to hit the stone so the water will come out. That is, of course, no doubt is beating. Then I said, let us look how the scholars get to the notion that beating the woman to force her to abide, how they get this idea. I found there is two traditions they misinterpret. The first one, a woman from Ansar came to the Prophet wasallam. she was beaten. He was very angry and he said he is going to be punished the same. And then say they said the ayah revealed and the woman, uh, the man was not beaten. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, I wanted something and Allah ordered something else and what Allah ordered is good. Now, in the first place, the Prophet Sallallahu was not happy with beating. So it is not going to be an excuse to say he, he has the right. Now the situation here is not he has the right to beat or not. But the point here, if beating happened, for example, it's wrong to steal, but when somebody is told, that's a different story, how to handle the situation. So the question here is how to handle the situation if the man beat his wife. Now, what the Prophet wanted is to publicly, of course, take uh, beat the man in the same manner he did. This way, the solution the Prophet Sallallahu thought of, it was not the right one. Because this will be the direct cause for divorce. And of course there is children, there is family relations, and there's going to be enmity that is not proper in this situation. What Allah asked, ordered, that they have to go into trying to resolve either they agree to stay together and behave themselves or to divorce without going into fights. That is the proper way because in the process, you know, Quran, if after going into all this trying the two between them, themselves to resolve, if they could not, then they uh, select one from the family of the husband and one from the family of the, of the wife and sit with them and try to resolve. If they accept Alhamdulillah, if not, they want to divorce, that's their rights. No problem. So, the point here, they misinterpret that tradition 
as if to give the husband the right to be that is why he was not punished. No, it is not. This is a tradition to deal with the thing when it happened, regardless if it is right or wrong, how to resolve. The second tradition, which also misinterpret, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said it clearly, be them lightly. He's talking about women. Now, he was not talking about dispute bit and misunderstanding between husband, wife and husband. He was talking direct in politely about adultery. It is a clear misconduct. And allowing ones whom you hate to see at your home to be there. Now, what the Prophet ﷺ did, it is very, very gentle, try to resolve the problem in a very gentle manner. Now, in this case, when the woman misbehave, the father cannot complain. The husband cannot complain. The, child, the son cannot, or daughter cannot complain. The brother cannot complain. Would she go playing rampant their uh, the situation? Now, usually, and it's still until now it happens, they call it committing the, cri the honor crime. They kill the woman. So the Prophet ﷺ was saying in that women, still human being, they could make mistakes. The waliul uh, amr, the guardian, if it is the father or the, the brother, should hit gently, not to take revenge. So really he was handling a situation in the best possible manner to resolve serious problem. It has nothing to do with misunderstanding between husband and wife. That was another mistake. Now, the scholars realized that really allowing beating it is not desirable so they said uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anh, said you know beat her with the uh, swak that is you know the stick to clean your mouth say like a pencil okay that resolve the problem in one way that is there is no beating but I cannot see in which way after advising, after showing that you are unhappy, that touching the shoulder with a pencil will resolve any issue. That could not be. Now also, let us go back and mention, when I looked at the meaning at the word daraba in different form, direct and indirect, uh, the meaning was, the general meaning, to take, go away, to cover, to separate. So that was the general meaning in this uh, use, uh, like Darab Allah, Mathalan, Allah gave an, gave an example, gave an example, has nothing to do with Daraba. Dribu fil ard, you know, go, uh, travel in the, in the world, this has nothing to do with, with beating. Anyway, so I said, let us look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what he did. When he was angry with them, and the dispute between him and his wives, he left the homes, to a place called Al Mashraba for a whole month without telling anybody anything. After that, he declared, There is a problem with my wives. Now, we find he did not beat anyone. He did not order somebody to do the beating because some people will say the Prophet himself would never do it by, by himself. He doesn't punish by himself, he asks others to do the punishment. Nor he allowed anybody to beat because Abu Bakr radiallahu an want to beat uh, Sayyidah Aisha his daughter Aisha the Prophet did not allow him so Umar ibn Khattab wanted to beat his uh, daughter Hafsa the Prophet didn't allow him that means the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the first one to disobey the order of the Quran that's not possible okay let us ask ourselves I said would leaving the house add to the process of reconciliation Yes, because leaving the house is the full picture of the separation of, or of divorce. The woman would know now he is not there, his care is not there, the relationship is not there. If she really wants divorce, that's her right. If no, she is playing games, she'd know now it is serious. She would realize the full results. So this really will add to the process 
of reconciliation. Now, that means the word daraba in this, in this ayah, it is not direct meaning. It means separation, leaving the house. And that is the very proper to the situation to bring reconciliation and better understanding and keep the relationships. Now, some of the scholars, they said, it's okay. It, we like this conclusion. But why did we not realize this for such a long time? I said simply because of the methodology. You did not analyze, understand situation, the action and reaction, and in which way to bring situation, and what kind of results happen to every action. That's, I think, where uh, it was just looking from linguistic point of view. That is, I think, very important to understand in dealing with the Sharia. Dr. Abu Suleiman delves deep into his research on Islamic traditions and shares his learnings with us. When I was in the International Islamic University, the director of the university, when I went there, it was a small university with about 1,000 students in two faculties, law and uh, economic. Now, and also, you know, uh, preparatory years uh, before they go into the college, the faculties, but they are put into big rooms with many beds together. I never spent this kind of residence during my life. But I found it really difficult. These young people will be there for many years. It will bring social conflict. Somebody would like to sleep, somebody would like to put the light on, somebody would like to hear the radio. All this will get them in trouble with it. one somebody would like to study. So, but you can do nothing about it because this is a state university and this cost. But then when the decision come to build the new campus, part of this new campus going to be 15,000 student residents. So I said to myself, I'm going to sit and make sure that the student will get the best possible benefits within the area located per, per student. So I said to myself, let me analyze what is the best and what is the second best. I said, is it the best really to have one student per room? I said, no. Simply because these young people come, come and Mother used to take care of them, cook and wash and do this and that. And, you know, he comes here, he has to take care of himself to cook and wash and do all these little things. And he will be going into a new kind of education, different approach. So I consider him like the family of a deceased. Don't leave him alone to cry for himself better keep him, you know, in the crowd. So one is not a good idea. Okay, I said to myself, two. I said, no, again, it's not a good idea. Because the two, surely something will happen between them to, you know, of conflict. Who's going to bow first? Who's going to accept, to admit? Who's going to allow? That will create a problem. I said, okay, three together. It's still not a good idea. Usually two will go more closer and the third will be out in the, in the open. Four, I found all kind of conflicts, resolution will be in this four. That is the minimum of what I call society. Now, at that point, it came to my mind a problem in Sharia could not be explained. Nobody ever said, why in adult, in, approve, in proving adultery, you need four witnesses? Why not two? Enough to execute, in case of somebody kill somebody, two enough to kill or to execute. Why not three? Why not five? Nobody explained why four. Yes, the group, yes. But, what is the point behind four? 
immediately I realize when I read the verse in the Quran the punishment is not for the action the punishment because you are hurting others by acting in society of this bad behavior to hurt others who are not part to your problem if you do that then you are punished for isha'atul fahisha to make the bad behavior common that is not allowed not acceptable and that is why also if the witnesses are less than four three in one case two or three see exactly what happened and the fourth give what you call say you know an evidence although you know it couldn't be anything else in what he said they are to be punished because they are less than four to see exact and they are the one who made this problem open that is why they are to be now then what is the if that means it's okay to commit adultery no there you have two things one is upbringing and education that the real way to deal with problems of the human nature because in human nature we can never say we are saved never to commit a mistake that's impossible that is why if you're going to spy on people and to follow on their weaknesses you make them you know feel unsafe that is not allowed and that is why the Prophet ﷺ, when he got the young man asking him for to, to allow him for adultery he didn't threaten him he made self self-control people who behave improper or open their homes for this kind of practices there is a different approach for this what they call al mufsidun fil the people who who spread corruption and not you cannot accuse him of adultery but you can accuse him of spreading the you know the corruption in the world that's a different story so what i here i discovered two things from i was working on nothing to do with sharia or with the penal code or anything i was discussing on thinking of social and and psychological problem i realize why it is for and what is the meaning of the punishment not only that that also led me to that is crimes and mistakes of two kind the human nature and the the rights of others like money or blood or you know this kind of crime now in crimes belong to human nature i find i cannot be i cannot say i never commit a mistake so i don't want you to fall behind me and to look behind me you make me unsafe and that is why when the uh, sayyidina amr the second khalif he had a noise in one house so he went over the wall and looked and find them drinking he brought them they said yes we drank but we didn't go outside we didn't disturb anybody he could not punish them because this is belong to human nature and this privacy it is not your right to go into the privacy you work in on education and upbringing in advice but you don't threaten uh, security of human being in his own self but when it comes to money or blood or this kind of crime the punishment is for the action itself because I want I may not never think to kill anybody or to steal from anybody but surely I will fear that somebody may kill me or may still uh, take my uh, uh, property that is where you want to stop that and that's why you accept two and even less than two other evidences to prove because you are for the action that's great second thing because that you know it led me to really to think about the human nature in some countries when they want people fear Islam they raise the issue of penal code it looks very severe if you kill you will be beheaded if you steal your hand will be cut if you make a uh, facade you will be uh, crucified or killed or cut your hand you know one hand and one leg that looks very severe and you know 
societies. So people will say, okay with Islam, it's great, but we cannot take that. I found there's, there's great misunderstanding about this, this issue. Look for example, if somebody kills somebody, yes, you could, the family could demand the execution of the person. But if you read the next ayah, you find, ask you to forgive, not really to go for revenge. But, of course, on the other hand, if the family are not accepting to, you know, to, uh, to help, it's better for revenge because that will kill much more people than that. So, execution is the ceiling, but you are required to go down even to let go. That means any punishment less than the ceiling, it's acceptable, as long as it prevents crime. And this is what you find in, uh, in even modern uh, societies. You find for some time they apply execution for certain crimes. In certain times they just uh, stop that. So it depends on what to stop the crime, it's not a revenge. Now we go for stealing. If we read the ayah, it says, whoever commit theft, cut the hand. Now, that means, السارق والسارقة فاقتوا يديهما جزاء ما كسبنا كلام من الله. أدى أميل أو رفيميل، person who steal has the hand will be cut. Now, that means anything anybody do which could be described as stealing, the hand should be cut. Even scholars they write that is not possible. So they looked at how it has been practiced and to find limitation to limit this kind of uh, punishment. So they came up to say it has to be a certain amount to make it possible to the hand to be cut and it has to be in a safe place where you know really it shows the intention to do and so on. Many of these. Now they did not realize that they are saying the Quran expression was loose. And they are, you know, trying to make it complete. This is not true. Because if they just read the next ayah, it says, if the person repent, Allah will accept. That means then cutting the hand is the ceiling. And it goes all the way to accept repent and. And that means if the person made a mistake, is if the lower punishment really make people not to go for this kind of crime. That's acceptable. It is the ceiling where really this kind of criminal could make, you know, great impact on society. And sometimes even that uh, stealing goes with other crimes. So if we look at it at the ceiling and the society and the sure of the society can choose any other kind of punishments which is enough to you know to protect society is acceptable but you don't, you cannot go beyond the ceiling in all case okay let's go to the third one people who made crimes which really disturb societies and spread corruption and problems it says in in الَّذِينَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَيَسْعَوْنَ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَسَادًا أن يقتلوا أو يصلبوا أو تقطع أيديهم وأرجلهم من خلاف أو ينفوا من الأرض. People who fight against Allah سبحانه وتعالى and His Messenger. That means about against the proper, you know, thing in society. And spread corruption. To be killed or crucified or hand and leg to be cut or to be expelled out of the uh, society. So you can see the killing is the ceiling. And it reached down to just make the society safe by sending him out, put him in jail. And especially nowadays, you know, crimes committed by addicts. It is really hideous and it's really terrible. So these people, 
to be put into prison and you don't allow them to go out until they are safe to the society. So you have the ceiling and you have the bottom. And if it's up to society and to people to select and decide in which way to punish, I don't think that make anybody fearful. As a matter of fact, in steering, Sayyidina Amr radiallahu anh, who was there is a kind of uh, shortage of food and uh, because of rain, uh, he did not, he stopped punishing anybody for stealing. Once also a young man who seemed to, to make a mistake committed the, uh, you know, a, a crime of stealing. So he told him, did you steal? Say no. He said no, let him go. So here, if we looked at hudud as the ceiling, you cannot go beyond and up to you to decide which can protect your society, I think that is very acceptable. It's not a problem at all.